Hello. Yeah. Didn't expect that one, did you? <laughs> usually, usually I say, hello, how are you guys? Welcome in, welcome in. No, you guys get a hello today. I don't know. <laughs> well, I hope you're all doing very, very well. Hello, hello, dance, and hello, laughs a lot. Welcome into both of you. I hope I will. I will do my regular intro. I hope everyone's doing well. How, how have you been, dance? I've uh, been a uh, been a little bit since uh, since we've talked. I hope uh, you're making lots of art and cool stuff. Uh, I'm I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm going to be going to a physio either next week or the week after for. Uh, for this knot in my back that just will not go away. It is so, so annoying. But, uh... I'm still able to go to the gym. I'm just taking it easy. I caught you only because I was doing some midnight renovating. Ooh. Midnight renovating. What are you What are you renovating? Uh, I recently had some, some renovations done as well. We had some, some windows replaced. I had to move my entire desk and PC and books... Uh, for for a few days or for two days, uh, over to the to another room while they did it because there was dust everywhere and it was covered in dust and it was horrible. But I put up like a bunch of sheets and stuff over over other shelves that I could not be bothered to clear, and uh, thankfully it was okay. Um, I was a little nervous. I had my desk in the room, sorry, and I covered it with a sheet. But I took my PC and I brought it into another room. Uh, I will say it was a hassle uh, unplugging and disconnecting everything. It's been a while since I did that. And I, afterwards, I got really scared because my P, my uh, desktop like screen, my the thing, was uh, was not turning on. Even though the PC, everything was fine. I, I even had a secondary screen to turn on where I could see everything was working perfectly. And I spent about half an hour. No, it was about 20 minutes, I'd say. Like, freaking out until I realized, oh, wait, the display port cable goes into the GPU uh, display port thing, not the the PC one. And I, I, I plugged it in and it immediately worked, and I felt like a dummy. Yeah, it's awful with dust. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, but it is it is nice to have some new windows, and they're, they're a little bit... Uh, there's a safety lock on there. There's a child lock. It's 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 important that I keep safe, guys. I have to, you know. It's important that I have a little child lock. I can't I can't open that. It's a little scary. I I could fall out the window. Uh, funny story about a child lock, actually. Um, uh, when I was uh, when I was a, a much much younger lad, back under the uh, back under the Sheed Mountains until I was led out by my mother. Uh, to go join the Fianna. Uh, I once stayed with my my human grandmother, and or great grandmother, I should say, and we had a little a little child lock for. Um, I think I can't remember what it was for. It was it was, and I don't actually remember this, but this was a story I was told. I thought I would never make that mistake. I had made it as well. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it seems like such a simple thing, but like I was just like unplug everything, get it all out. I because I, I was like, oh, I'll know, I'll remember where to put things, and then I did not. I did not remember where to put things at all. It reminds me when I first built my PC, I got really concerned because it wouldn't turn on, and then I I remembered I didn't actually plug in the the power cable. <laughs> I got so scared, and my heart my heart dropped after a whole day of building a PC. Of putting it all together like big Legos, it just didn't turn on, and I, I was like, I was like, oh no, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to do it all again tomorrow. And I think the worst part was thinking, how much of this am I going to have to take out, unscrew? My back was already like seizing up because I was bent over all the time. Um, <laughs> um, but going back to the child lock story, so uh, I think it was something to do with. Was it like like peanuts or something, or so, so something that could easily like you could easily choke on, or it might have been, I can't remember. It was some container anyway. It was some container containing something that a, a baby shouldn't have, and I, I was like a toddler at the time. I was right like three or four, I think. Um, so this is this is you know, uh, almost seventeen, eighteen hundred years ago. Um, and my great grandmother was minding me, 
and she couldn't get it open. Um, they hadn't shown her how to how to how it was meant to be opened. Um, and she was like, you know, she didn't know if you pushed and twisted or if you you had to turn her a certain way or turn her a certain amount of times. And she was getting very confused about it. And I came over, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I know how to do it. I saw, I saw, uh, I saw my grandmother open it before, and I took it from her and I opened it. <laughs> Um, I think very very perceptive as a child, I suppose. Um, the child lock that was meant to protect me, I just I just knew I just knew. I suppose I'm like a cat or like a dog. You know, dogs who learn. Oh, if I if I press down on the uh, that handle thing, the door will open and I can leave. Some dogs are like that. Some dogs are very very dumb. Children learn really easy. They, they they do. They do. Some of them do anyway. Some of them are fucking idiots. <laughs> but the the idiot ones are funny. Um, but that that in itself was was quite a was quite funny. Um, it's a shame I don't I don't I don't remember it. But uh, it's a it's a story that um, sometimes comes up. That same great grandmother when she uh, when she passed. Uh, God rest her soul. Um, we were doing a clean up of the of the house, and uh, didn't we find underneath her bed, uh, hidden in a little in a little box underneath some, uh, under, I think it was just like a piece of clothing or something folded up, um, uh, a half empty bottle of vodka or a bottle of vodka, yeah, um, really nice vodka too. <laughs> so we all um, we all had a well, I didn't because I was younger back then, but. Uh, we all had a couple of couple of drinks. Uh, they did family. Again, I was a babe. But um, <laughs> uh. secret party stash. Yeah, she was definitely a party animal. We have a, we have a photo of her somewhere. Actually, I will not say that. I will not say that. Uh, I was about to say something, uh, but then I remembered. There's this whole idea of operational security. Um, and if you guys are worried about your operational security, you can get a discount with my code fuckface for NordVPN. I don't fucking know. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, uh, she was, uh, I do miss her. Uh, but yeah, it was definitely, definitely funny. Some of the, some of the stories that one can, one can find about her. Um... What 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 are you? What are you renovating, dance? Any, anything big, or is it just like little little bits and pieces, little DIY that you're doing that like you can't sleep at midnight, so you're like might as well be productive. That's like the worst part when when you go to sleep, or when you go you go to go to sleep, and uh, your brain just kicks up into into like sixth gear, and you can't you can't get to sleep. It just it just runs and. It's either gonna pull a memory of something that you did that was really embarrassing, or it just like you have some of your best ideas and you don't want to go to sleep because you know you won't have those ideas in the morning. How confused how confused are you guys when you wake up in the morning? Hello, copyright, welcome in, welcome in. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you're doing quite well. Gonna repaint the whole room so it's plastering the holes and cracks and all that. Ah, Handyman dance. Nice. I hope. I uh, hope it goes nice and nice and easy. Um, but uh, like when when I wake up in the morning, uh, when I wake up in the morning, if I'm woken up by someone, I can be very confused for a moment. I won't like, especially I think if you wake me up. Uh, I I guess it's like it depends on when you fall asleep because you have those you have your sleep cycle and if you get woken up particularly at like in the deepest part of your sleep you're gonna be like fucked for like t ten seconds, um, but sometimes when I wake up even if I wake up myself I'll get up and I'll be I'll be thinking and I'll be like talking to myself in my head, but it will be complete rambling, it won't be it will be completely incoherent. I started writing down my dreams after I wake up uh, a while ago. That makes things a bit more coherent. 
Ah, oh, that's like dream journals are very, very cool. I, I, I wouldn't mind mind doing them. I'm doing just great. How about you? I'm doing pretty well, copyright. It's the weekend, so I'm I'm nice and happy. We're gonna be doing some a little bit of reading later, uh, trust me. Uh, we're gonna be continuing our stuff about uh uh Philip the Second of Macedon. Uh hopefully dance I can be a nice kind of audio book in the background for you while you're doing some uh some of your plastering. Um but like it how do I just I, I can't even define it or describe it properly because I can't ramble incoherently as as I do when I wake up when I'm perfectly uh, awake it's just sort of like I'm thinking about something and I'm talking about but I don't know what I'm thinking about so I'll be I'll be like I'll be like in the shower having ref been refreshed by the shower and I'll be like yeah, I don't know if that's such a good idea. I mean, if we if we do that, then that's... And I'll, I'll, I'll stop. And at some point, I will just wake up properly. I'll be like, what am I talking about? Uh, hello, hello, clever. Welcome in as well. I used to faint relatively before and wake up from that confused. That sounds a little concerning, Last a lot. Please make sure you... Like, I hope I hope that's not happening much anymore. You will do what? I'll I'll be I'll be I ramble incoherently to myself when like in my mind when I wake up in the morning. It takes me a little bit to uh to wake up. Oh, I was done for now. I was gonna go to bed when you popped up. I thought I'd come say hello. Ah, thank you, thank you very much, Dance. I know uh, time scheduling can be a little tricky, and and I'm like I stream so late <laughs> for my regular time zone. Uh, because I am, I am so so busy. I think I'm gonna fall asleep to the stream if you don't mind. Not at all, dance. Not at all. I usually, I usually do about maybe 15, 20 minutes of kind of just chatting before I get into the, the book reading, and then then my voice will will soften a little, and it will probably be more conducive to falling asleep. Uh, I fainted before at school once. Scrapped my scraped your whole back on your bed and woke up thinking about the best use for Kerrigan. <laughs> You're also stoned. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> who knows last lot maybe your maybe your greatest uh heroes of the storm uh competitive uh meta defining ideas came as you <laughs> fell onto the floor <laughs> unconscious <laughs> like fully mid thought that's that's amazing <laughs> I have to do something first, so I come in a little later. No, no worries, copyright. Go, uh, go do what you need to. Um, but yeah, like it, it's kind of like that as well for me last while. It's like it's like I'm thinking about something, but I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the topic of conversation is in my own mind. And uh, and when I realize that, everything, I just get so confused. And it happens most days. Most days I wake up. I think it's just like... I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's fucking psychosis. Or sch schizophrenia. It could, maybe I need to start taking some meds. But uh, around VTubers, none of us take meds. Because if you guys take your meds, I'll probably disappear. And, I mean... You know, we don't want our Oshi to disappear either. Very important. Don't take your meds. Ah... <laughs> uh. But uh, I'm certainly happy that uh, oh dance we we both know that like it's it's we can't take our meds because Nade will disappear. We'll we'll all be very sad if she disappeared. I've been I've been um for those of you who don't know Nadeshko. Uh, Nadeshko is a wonderful VTuber. Uh, one of my one of my Oshis, and I, I love her very very much. Uh, don't don't get to catch her streams as much anymore because I am just busy, 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 busy bee. Uh, I'm sure many of you are probably sick of me saying it, um, but hopefully I can uh, catch some more of them. Mm -hmm. But I <laughs> oh she's so ah I want to watch her streams now. I I've there's few streamers that I laugh as much at. As her, just just listening to her ramble, it's amazing. Well, I got books on early American history, people in early American history, and a bit about the economic situation of early America. 
Sounds like you have a particular interest at the moment, Clever. Sounds like you're getting uh, deep into early American history. Is early American? I'm assuming I'm assuming colonial uh, 13 states. Not necessarily... Maybe by early American you mean 1774. Uh, US, was it 1774? I think it was, wasn't it? Uh, with the US Revolution. Or else maybe you mean even before that, kind of the development of of that. No, Federalist and Democratic and Republican. Ah, I see, I see, I see. So kind of that that development, that's very interesting. So a little bit afterwards, how they have things kind of settle down after the revolution. Very cool, very cool. I totally didn't forget to mute my phone again. I promise, guys, I am a professional, professional streamer. Hamilton versus Jeffersonian. I am not very knowledgeable on that time period. But uh, let's all start to get a little bit more knowledgeable into the history of Philip II of Macedon. When we last left off, uh, we had just came to, not to the end of the Sacred War, but really Philip's master stroke in the Sacred War. Uh, having suffered defeat at the hands of Onomarchus in an ambush, um, an ambush and trickery, Rua was taking a nap. <laughs> no, I was probably I was probably busy with other stuff over in Ireland. Probably was taking a nap under a mountain. Um, but when we last left off, on him, uh, Philip had avenged his loss to Onomarchus. They had completely crushed the uh, the Phocian and Phorean army at the Battle of Crocus Field, uh, likely killing Onomarchus and Philip crucifying his body and uh, executing the, I believe it was around 3,000 prisoners he took as retribution against those who were religious pariahs having raided the Delphi treasury, the Oracle of Delphi. Uh, in doing so, he also went on to capture uh, Ferrey, taking out the uh, tyrants there, and essentially uh, bringing Thessaly under his under his domain. For they elected him Archon, leader of a series of Greek states of Thessaly. Thessaly itself being one of the major horse uh, kind of cavalry areas in Greece, unlike the heavy infantry focused uh, southern Greek states. And this would only add to Philip's uh, dominance and cavalry, uh, which was his major arm of decision. Now, this was quite unprecedented for a, for a foreigner to be so, but in their eyes, Philip's ha Philip had saved them, not just from the Phorean tyrants, but also from Phocus and uh, had basically wined and dined them during this time as well. And in a, in a single battle, and a little bit of, of time afterwards, he, he has brought a major part of Greece under his control. He, he feigned an attack, an invasion, into, into Greece, but having come to uh, find that the Pass of Thermopylae was covered by Phocians and Athenians and even Spartans for all of the major uh, Greek states had moved soldiers to the pass to defend it should Philip and, uh, well, really Macedon attempt to invade. Now, the book argues that this was likely not actually a proper invasion by Philip, that he didn't want to, that it wasn't in his interest, for he was facing some other issues at home uh, the people of of uh, Chalcedes were the Chalcedian League were becoming a bit of an issue, particularly Olynthos. Slight point of interest: Athens started investing a bit in, more into spear throwing peltas at the time, but it didn't get very far in new developments. Hmm. I wonder. I wonder was that seeing? Because I imagine that who were I believe it was the Thracians, wasn't it? The, the Thracians are the people who have the, the particularly skilled peltasts. 
and they became a major part of Philip's skirmishing force. Hello, D. Welcome in. I'm doing pretty well. We're just about to begin our book reading. I just gave a brief synopsis of, of where we are now and uh, the chapter we're about to start. I hope you're doing well. I hope you have a, a lovely Saturday morning. Or no. Yeah. Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it? I always get mixed up. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> I am right. I am right. I'm sorry. My, my brain got confused. I can, I can remember uh, large historical tracts. I do not know the days of the week and uh, where they are in different parts of the world. <laughs> I get confuddled. But uh, I hope you're doing well, Dee. Time is a mystery. It really, really is. Um, I could go on to a whole rant about whether change, about, about like the metaphysics of change and in relation to things like time, but I will not bore you. I will do that another time. I'm currently reading a book about, uh, about theology and metaphysics, and uh, I think it's quite a heavy book, and it would take a lot of, there'd be a lot of stopping and starting to try and explain things or recover ground uh, in relation to certain things. I wonder could I do like a PowerPoint presentation on those type of books instead, where I summarize a chapter or like the main points of a chapter. Uh, I don't know if I could do that quite well, but it might be an interesting way to do a book type stream. It would be like a lecture. <laughs> you love a PowerPoint. Oh no, I'll have to put, I'll have to make it all fancy. I'll have to have like cool animations. I'll have to go back to when I'm when you were in like like fourth class and you made a presentation about like your favorite your favorite uh dinosaur or something or your like something something that was your favorite thing and you had like all the cool like dust or particle effects and swipes and ups and downs and swirls Brach brachiosaurus they're based they're based <laughs> but enough about brachiosaurus. We're going to move a little bit, a little bit further, further in time, to chapter six of uh, Richard A. Gabriel's Philip the Second of Macedonia, greater than Alexander. The road to empire. After returning from Termo Termopylae, Philip spent several weeks in Thessaly, putting the affairs of his new possession in order. Afterwards, he returned to Bella, where the army rested and was replenished. For the next campaign. Philip's victory at the Crocus Field had re-established his military prestige. His defeat at the hands of Onomarchus the previous year had led to important changes in the political conf configuration of Macedonian power in Thrace, Chalcedes Solinthos and Illyria P Paeonia, as these state rulers sought to take advantage of Philip's weakness and loosen his grip on their affairs. With, their, with his military prestige now restored, Philip set about re-establishing Macedonian political influence in the recalcitrant, recalcitrant, recalcitrant. I've always just read that word. Hang on, let me let me look that word up and see. I'm fairly sure. Recalcitrant. Yeah, recalcitrant. That's it. Recalcitrant territories. Thrace. Philip first turned his attention to Thrace, where events had seriously altered the previous power balance between Athens and Macedonia in eastern Thrace. During the year following Philip's defeat, the Athenian general Chares had captured Cestus and the Chironese as part of a more aggressive Athenian policy to obtain control of the Chironese and to protect its access to the route leading through the Sea of Mamara to the Black Sea. Chares executed all the adult ma males of Cestus and sold the remainder of the population into slavery. Athens sought to take advantage of Philip's weakened position and his occupation with events in Thessaly. Chares opened negotiations with Sertablites, who promptly abandoned his alliance with Philip, and ceded to Athens all the cities of the Chironese with the exception of Cardia. Athens promptly sent settlers to occupy the cities and lands. Sertablites also formally recognized the Athenian claim to Amphipolis. 
bracket, Athens was still waiting for Philip to honor his promise to deliver Amphipolis into its hands. Shortly thereafter, Sertoblites tried to offer his lot of offset. That's probably Kersoblites. Off offset his losses in the Chironese by attacking those territories in eastern Thrace, claimed by Perinthus and Byzantium, and Amadocus's kingdom in central Thrace. I believe Amadocus and Sertoblites are brothers, if I remember correctly. His Thrace was split between three brothers, wasn't it? I think it might have been. Uh, Stegosaurus was always my pick. Ste I like Stegosauruses too. Oh, my pick. I don't know. I would have to. I'd have to think a little bit on it. Stegosaurus is a pretty cool. I like the one that was like a giant, like a giant armadillo. It had the the ball at the end of its tail, and it would whack things with it. What was that one? I don't remember. These changing circumstances, Ankylosaurus, Ankylosaurus. I think that's it. Yeah. These changing circumstances occurred at the expense of Macedonian economic and security interests in the region, and Philip quickly grasped the threat. Especially troubling was the increase in Athenian power, which would inevitably bring it into conflict with the Macedonian aspirations in Thrace. In September 352 BC, Philip and the Macedonian army left Pella for, th for the 300-mile, 20-day march to eastern Thrace. The ships of the Macedonian navy accompanied them. Moving along the coast and carrying Philip's siege equipment, the army's heavy baggage and additional food, Philip's route took, took him through Amphipolis and Philippi before reaching Heraeon. Heraeon, Tecos, modern Tecadag, or Caravit Velati, which was Sertablites' westernmost front fort at the coast of the Sea of Mamara and 18 miles west of Perinthos. In November, Philip brought the fortress under siege. Let me check, because I believe there may have been a... Hmm, it's not that great. There's a map that kind of shows things, but I don't think that's... No, unfortunately I don't think there is a map of this region exactly. When Philip arrived in Thrace, he found willing allies in Amadocus and the cities of Perinthos and Byzantium, which were already engaged in hostilities with Sertoblites. They joined forces with Philip. Philip was likely aware of the conflict in eastern Thrace before he left Pella and sought to exploit it for his own ends. When the Athenians learned that Philip was in Thrace besieging Herion, the assembly voted to protect its newly won acquisitions the Chironese and aid Sertoblites. The assembly agreed to send 40 triremes and a large levy of citizen soldiers to Thrace, and, a, and approved 60 talents of for expenses. On the face of it, the expedition might have been successful if it had only had to deal with Philip's army. But against Philip and his allies, the Athenian attempt to rescue Sertoblites faced almost certain failure. The Athenian force would, would have required 40 triremes to transport some 4,000 hoplites and numerous transports for their supplies. We have no figures for the number of troops Philip had with him, but it must have, must have been at least half the Macedonian army, or some 10,000 infantry and 300 cavalry. With the military forces of Perinthos, Amadocus, and Byzantium, the allied troops far outnumbered the Athenians. Moreover, Philip's allies all possessed naval forces, and when joined with Philip's own ships, the alliance effectively controlled the sea in this zone of military operations. The Athenian convoy would have risked being attacked and sunk before it made landfall in Thrace. All in all, the Athenian expedition would have been a disaster. As it turned out, the Athenian expedition never put to sea. The initial Athenian decision to support Sertoblites in Thrace seems to have been made soon after hearing the news that Philip was besieging Herion Tecos in November 351 BC. The Athenian plan was based on the assumption that Philip was campaigning alone. Under these circumstances, giving Sertoblites aid made some sense, but when new intelligence reached Athens that Philip had joined an alliance with Amadocus, Perinthos, and By Byzantium, it must have been abundantly clear that the proposed Athenian relief force would stand little chance against the forces now arrayed against it in Thrace. 
cooler heads prevailed and cancelled the expedition. For almost a year, Philip campaigned in Thrace, fighting several battles and capturing numerous towns and cities. Justin tells us that Philip cast out some of the rulers and others he placed on their thrones, something Philip could have done by capturing their territories first. There are no exact extent extant accounts of Philip's combat operations, but it might be reasonably inferred that several engagements took place over 10 to 11 months. It is also significant that Philip campaigned during the winter. Winter weather in eastern Trace can be truly uncomfortable for an army in the field and present a serious logistical challenge. Philip's successful winter campaign in Thrace again shows that the Macedonian army possessed an all-weather, all-season combat capability that no other army in Greece had. In July or, Org or August 351 BC, when the with the campaign completed, Philip fell seriously ill. Rumor reached Athens that he was dead. The news must have raised hope in Athens that Philip was gone, or that with Philip gone, the Thracian alliance might disintegrate, and Athens would be in a position to recover its position there. That's the uh, danger of campaigning in the winter, I suppose. Back then, like a sniffly cold, it could mean death. <laughs> in September, the Athenians authorized Sheradimos, quote, with ten ship, empty ships and five silver, ta silver talents for expenses, to sail the Thrace. The term empty ships refers to the fact that no citizen hoplites were sent, and that Sheradimos had to recruit his own troops for the voyage. But if Philip was still thought to be in Thrace and the alliance intact, Sheridimos' little fleet would li likely have either been sunk at sea by the Allied navies, or crushed immediately by the Allied ground forces upon landing. Under these circumstances, Sheridimos' venture was suicidal. His voyage suggests the word had reached Athens sometime in late summer that Philip had recovered from his illness, and was marching back to Pella, and that the members of the alliance against Sertablites had returned to their territories and disbanded their armies. For the campaigning season. Under these circumstances, Sheridimos's expedition, expedition made sense. Athens needed a thorough assessment of the damage Philip's campaign had done to its interests and trace, as well an assess as an assessment of the political in environment Athens would face when rebuilding its position in eastern Thrace. Sheridimos was essentially leading a reconnaissance operation to appraise, appraise the strategic, military, and political situation. Meanwhile, Philip's campaign had restored both his military and political reputation and prestige in Thrace, and increased Macedonian influence in the region. Sertablites had been forced to come to terms, which permitted Philip to place friendly rulers in some cities and towns. To ensure Sertablites observed the conditions of the truth, his son was taken to, F to Pella as a hostage. The cities of Perinthos and Byzantium remained on good terms with Philip, and saw Macedonian influence in the region as an effective counterweight to Athens. Whatever latent threat Sertablites and the Athenians had posed to Philip's possessions in Thrace was, for the time being at least, greatly diminished. Amadocus was now in his eighties and effectively reduced to the status of a client king, just as Cataporus in western Thrace had been. With Perinthos and Byzantium friendly to Philip, there was little to stop a Macedonian army from marching from Philippi to the Bosporus. Philip's Tracian campaign had opened the road to a strategic strike at the Athenian food supply, for Philip could close the Bosporus to the Athenian wheat fleet, then move from the Black Sea through the narrow waterway each spring to Athens. Athens depended on this route for 40% of its food, which was now at great risk. Now we look to Epirus. Philip stopped briefly at Olynthos on his way back from Thrace, for reasons that will be explained shortly before arriving at Pella sometime in November 350 BC. The army went into winter quarters and gathered its strength for Philip's next campaign. In the spring of 350 BC, Philip ordered the army into action again, this time taking it, into, taking it west into Illyria, Paeonia, and Malo uh, Malasia. Or Molus Molusia. There are no accounts of Philip's actions in Illyria and Paeonia, and we have only Demosthenes' mention of them as evidence that they occurred at all. Illyria and Paeonia had been brought under Macedonian control in 358 BC, after their crushing defeat by Philip. 
I might pull up a small map. Because there is some mentions here, and I kind of have a good idea where things are. And maybe you guys may not. Uh, I like this map. This map is quite old. It's just when Philip had taken over. At this point, Philip essentially controlled Macedonia, the historical limits, I think, like, this much of Illyria, uh, all of Thessaly. He has, as we learned, he has pretty much this region of Thrace, and this and these cities are friendly to him. So really, it's sort of like this. <laughs> he is really, really strong. I think in the center is where Sertobetes might be. Uh, but currently he, so he stopped off at Olynthos, and then marched into Paeonia, Illyria, and uh, Malusians, I believe, are down here, the Malusians. When Onomarchus drove Philip from Thessaly in 353 BC, Illyria and Paeonia may have attempted to lift a Macedonian yoke either by local revolt or by embarking upon diplomatic approaches to gain Athenian support. Athens had supported the previous revolt by Illyria, Paeonia and Thrace against Philip, and something similar may have been foot again, causing Philip to use the army to remind them who was master in the new Macedonia. Demosthenes says Philip was fortifying cities in Illyria during the time. The reasons for Philip's attacks on the Molosians of Epirus are unclear. The Kingdom of Epirus was a coalition comprising of four major tribes under the leadership of Aribas, the High King. Aribas was the uncle of Philip's Epirot wife, Olympias, whom he had married in 357 BC as the price of an alliance with the Molosian coalition. Until 350 BC, there seems to have been no difficulties with the alliance, and why Philip moved against his allies is puzzling. The tribes oh, apologies. The tribes of uh, oh, wait, wait. the tribes of Upper Macedonia were related more to the Molosians than they were to the Macedonians in dialect, origin and way of life, and perhaps Philip saw these cultural loyalties as a potential threat to the Macedonian control and integration of the upper upper can cantons. It is possible that as excuse me a moment. I think there's someone at the door. Okay, no, never mind. All it was was uh, it was the the ground door had been opened, and uh, <laughs> hello, Renata. Hello, Renata. I hope you're doing very, very well. Uh, for those of you who don't know. Uh, I believe nine. I'll I'll post an update anyway later later tomorrow. Uh, but around nine p.m. my time, Irish time, I believe, or maybe half nine. Uh, I will be doing a large uh, collab of a virtual novel. Uh, is I think that's what we're doing. Yeah, I don't really know. I just got asked by Ace and a couple of other people to do it. Um, but Renata will be there as well. So it will be um will be a fun little fun little thing. We'll be voice acting. So uh, I'll I'll post a link to to the stream when it goes live. But it's gonna be my first proper proper collab. Uh, I hope I hope I don't become really nervous and don't say anything and people think I'm like antisocial. Very possible. <laughs> knock knock at me. A cup of sugar, please. No, I actually don't don't like I don't drink sugar with my tea so I like I'd say if I was like if if I was living on my own would I even have sugar I don't know I don't know if I would because I don't really use sugar for much things um that's hard to say I, I you'd be very disappointed D I'm sorry voice act the games I <laughs> it's gonna be it's, like ace is um is a very good voice actor. He has like he has such a well well trained voice, um, and I think he's actually done actual uh, actual uh, voice acting work. So he's going to be doing real things, and I'm going to have like two voices. I'm going to have my regular voice. I'm going to have uh, like an old man voice, and then I'm going to completely fail at doing random accents. I'm sure. 
I'm sure we'll figure something out. I don't know how we're going to figure out who's going to be certain characters, though. We'll have to discuss that beforehand. Or maybe on the fly, we'll just have to be like, okay, I'm this person. I'm going to have to write down everyone that I am. I don't know how the game works. Uh, excuse me a moment, I hear knocking again. to be interrupted again. I also don't use sugar with my tea and drink my tea neat. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Um, I remember I, I had sugar with tea like a couple of months ago for the first time in ages. Someone just made it and put like a just a single uh, spoonful and it was too, so sweet. I was like, ugh, that's actually disgusting. It wasn't that bad, but it was like, it was like just such a weird taste to me after all that time. It is also possible that, as others had, Arribas had sought to exploit Philip's defeat in some way that made Philip doubt his loyalty. Once more, no accounts of Philip's battles survive, but given what happened to the Malosian king, or the Malazian king in the coalition, it seems certain that some sort of armed conflict took place that resulted in Arribas's surrender and acceptance of relatively harsh terms. Whatever Arbibas's offence was, it must have been as serious for it to cost him his throne that he had occupied since 360 BC, when his brother, Neotolmus, Olympias's father, died. Philip reduced Arbibas to the status of regent for Arbibas's nephew and Olympias's younger brother, Alexandros, thus creating a new line of succession. I wonder whose idea that was, knowing, uh... Knowing Olympias, I'm sure she had a particular word in Philip's ear. The twelve-year-old Alexandros was removed from the country, taken to Pella, where he would remain for the next eight years, and educated in the ways of the Macedonians. Philip suspended the king's right to issue coins, and the Melogian currency was repl replaced with Philip's bronze currency for domestic exchange. He then annexed the remaining tribal kingdoms of Typhae, Typhae, and Paro, Paro, Paraue, the easternmost regions of the Melogian tribal state, and extended Macedonian influence to the coastal areas of Epirus. So I'm guessing he's effectively. It sounds like he's taken over all of Epirus, or at least effectively made it a client kingdom. Philip's in Philip encouraged some of the residents to build towns and forgo their pastoral existence for a more settled life. Over time, this transition seems to have occurred, and then Philip established a militia, uni militia units there, and introdu introduced the use of the Sarissa and the Phalanx. Philip intended to integrate the people of Epirus into the Macedonian national state, just as he had integrated the Macedonian upper cantons. The War with Olynthus and I, uh, I think what well, I will do, because I'm a little bit more prepared for this one, is I uh, don't want to do that. Is I will pull up a, a map of Chalcides, or uh, the kind of region of Olynthos. Olynthos being down here. So if you guys are wondering exactly where Olynthos is, it's a. Uh, Oh, I don't know where to click. There we go. It's uh, just this region here. So this is the area we're going to be focusing on for a little bit. And these guys have been kind of a thorn in Macedon's side. Even even after the expansion in the Thrace, down into Thessaly, into Epirus, all the way into Illyria and Paeonia, these guys are still incredibly powerful. I don't know if they just had really good land down here, because it doesn't look that large, but there was a lot of cities and they were all in a big league. And Olynthos was the main city. And even even during a time when Philip was quite strong, they still remained a, a thorn in his side. So let's see how how this goes. Let me make that map just a tiny bit bigger. 
There we go. Philip had been concerned with Olventos and the 32 cities of the Chalcedian League that had led from the beginning of his reign. Every time I see this map, it makes me want to play Civ. <laughs> I get like that as well. I want to play like CK3 or 2 um, and make, make funny borders. Its strategic geograph geographic location at the head of the Tremaic Gulf, its economic power and large population, and its considerable military forces constituted a potentially serious threat to Macedonian security. The Macedonian ports were off the sh main shipping lanes. So much of Macedonian trade moved through Chalcedian ports. Or it might be called, it might be Chals Chalcidian. I'm actually going to look that up just before I... I Chalcidian pronunciation. Yeah, because because in ancient Greece, um, they didn't have the soft C. Okay, I have a Greek person pronouncing it Chalcidios. Cal Chalcidian is what I might pronounce it. Hang on, there's a. I don't know if you guys can hear this. No, you shouldn't be able to. There's a there's like ad playing. Hmm. Ah, so it's Chalcidian is apparently the, which is weird because it has a C H. I think even in the, uh, in the English language version they wouldn't put a a K a C H for a K sound, but I suppose they did. I will pronounce it as uh, Chalcidian. Let's stick with Chalcidian. Or Chal Chalcides. Where were we? Ah, yeah. In 356 BC, Philip had concluded an alliance, alliance with Olynthos to deprive Athens of a possible ally in the Gulf and guarantee him freedom of action in Paeonia, Illyria, and Thrace. As proof of his sincerity, Philip had not only captured the Athenian naval base at Potidae and turned it over to Olynthos, as promised, but he had also insisted that the treaty be sworn at Delphi and the articles of agreement be deposited at the shrine. Philip's ability to conduct his military campaigns between 358 BC and 351 BC depended on Olynthos observing its obligations under the treaty and remaining aloof from Philip's affairs. Most important was Olynthos' obligation not to seek alliance with Athens. The treaty's equally important but unwritten diplomatic understanding was Olynthos' obligation to no longer interfere in Macedonian domestic affairs. By 351 BC, both of these commitments were in doubt. On his way back from the Thracian campaign in the fall of 351 BC, Philip stopped at Olynthos with the Macedonian army not far behind, no doubt so the Olynthians might feel its presence. There is no information to what had raised Philip's suspicions, but if Olynthos had, had again been exploring an alliance with Athens, as it had following Philip's defeat in 353 BC, it is not unreasonable that Philip's intelligence network might have gotten wind of it. Olynthos had openly been in contact with Athens since 353 BC and had, Demosthenes tells us, already concluded a peace treaty with Athens, so as to repair relations strained during Philip's siege of Amphipolis. I'm going to take a little, a little drink. Olynthos may have been concerned with the expa expansion of Macedonian power in Thrace and began more serious discussions with Athens regarding a military alliance. Olynthos's treaty with Philip prohibited such a deal and would have been of great concern to Philip. Justin suggests that the cause of Philip's concern was, his, was the presence of his two half-brothers, Menelaus and Herodias, in Olynthos. 
the city had been given them sanctuary following their attempt to prevent Philip's rise at a Macedonian throne. In addition, Demosthenes implies that strong anti-Macedonian factions in Olynthus regarded Philip as a threat and wished to conclude an alliance with Athens. Philip may have concluded that Olynthus was planning some sort of intervention in Macedonia, perhaps with Athenian help, aimed at removing Philip by military means and replacing, replacing him with one of his half-brothers. Olynthus had a long history of intervening in Macedonian politics, and a renewed attempt along these lines to weaken or replace Philip could not, have, could not be reasonably discounted. We have no account of Philip's discussions with Olynthos except Demosthenes' cryptic statement that Philip made a move against Olynthos. That there was no military action seems certain, and Theopompus is probably correct that Philip delivered a stern warning to the city's leaders while the Macedonian army was encamped close by. As serious as the potential threat from Olynthos was, Philip was in no position to deal with it at present. At present. On his return from Thrace, Philip had learned that events in Illyria, Paeonia, and Epirus demanded his immediate attention. As he had done often, Philip used his diplomatic skills to deal with Olynthos by reminding its leaders in serious tones of their treaty obligations, but taking no further action. The discussions seemed to have had some effect, and the Olynthi Olynthians expelled Apollon Apollonides, the leader of the anti-Macedonian faction from the city. In addition, two friends of Philip's, Lasthenes and Euthycrates were elected to important military posts of commanders of the Olyn Olynthian cavalry. The question of Athens, however, was not addressed. The Olynthians were trying to allay Philip's fears with diplomatic gestures. The realities remained, however, and Philip was a man who always dealt in realities. The fact that, there, that those documents, that, that treaty, was deposited at the at the area of Delphi, and Philip had recently essentially been seen as uh, the protector of of religious of I guess the religious religiosity of the Oracle of Delphi, the protector of the gods and executioner of of traitors and defilers. I wonder how much that may have played a part in Olynthus kind of just trying to allay his fears a little, at least for a time. Was there this kind of perception of Philip? That his threats, of course, he controlled probably the do most dominant army in the region, but was it also, you know, were they worried that he may very well have the gods on his side? After settling the problems in Illyria, Paeonia, and Epirus, Philip turned his attention to Olynthos and the Chalcidian League. Or the Chalcidian League. In the spring of 349 BC, Philip demanded that Olynthos surrender his half-brothers to him. Olynthos refused, and in midsummer, Philip attacked Chalcidian, Chalcides. Justin's suggestion that Philip went to war because Olynthos would not turn over his half-brothers to him is probably incorrect. More serious reasons of state were at hand. Philip could simply not tolerate Olynthos's attempted approachment, reapproachment with Athens, for if it were to succeed, Macedonian security would be gravely at risk, and you can see why if if all of Chalcidis were to ally with Athens, you would not only have this massive army and support network uh, facing you right at the bottom of your border, right into the heartland of Pella, which is just up here, but you would have easy ports and areas for uh, the Athenian navy and its allies to dock and just march. Again, you would have probably the strongest, or one of the strongest anyway, Greek states allying with one of the other strongest Greek states and having a beeline into your capital. That is not what you want. Macedonian security. Oh, Philip moved against the Chalcidians to prevent this alliance. In midsummer 349 BC, Philip's army moved over land through Macedonia on a route that took him north of Lake Bolba, and allowed him to enter Chalcides or Chalcides, far to the east of the capital of Olynthus. Philip held a mil military advantage. He was fighting close to his home base along internal supply lines against an enemy whose force were dispersed among 32 cities, all located on open ground. That's often a uh, often. A difficult situation, especially when uh, 
when they're leagues and it's not a conjoined kind of national unity because the city-states will likely care for their own. Uh, at least some of them will. Some of them will turn over to the invaders. Some of them will, will look to protect their own cities. Their armies will return home to protect there. And that allows, essentially, defeat in detail to occur, where the invading force can begin to pick off uh, certain cities and certain areas and regions and massively weaken and take the initiative from the defenders. Uh, it requires the various people to put aside their legion allegiances to their local cities, which is very, very difficult because by the time the army has, say, formed at Olynthos and is on the march, Philip may have already destroyed and enslaved or killed your, your entire city. Now, you know, with, with Philip, that's likely not to be the case, but you'd still be worried that, you know, your city would be easily taken and sacked. From the beginning of the invasion, Philip held the, initi held the initiative, and the Chalcidians always the defensive. He quickly overran a small fortress guarding the northern approaches to the city of Stag Stagrius, Stagarus, Aristotle's birthplace, and attacked the city. Philip's engineers went about their work, and the city fell in a relatively short time. Philip then ordered Stagarus completely destroyed. There is no record of what happened to the city's population, but rather than sell it into slavery, Philip likely turned it loose to wander throughout Chalcid Chalcidius and tell others what would happen if they resisted Philip's advance. And right there, he's... I know I just spoke on it, but he's... I think he's kind of... Of course he's fed, setting in fear, but he's also wanting that to happen. He wants them to be... to be, uh, struggling. So, I think it sounds like he marched. There's Stagaria. But that's not Stagoras, so... I feel like Stagoras would be... Oh no, it said that he marched around Lake Bulba, so I don't know if maybe this map... That's likely where it was. So he marched around and came down this region. Philip's policy of striking terror in the hearts of the League's cities paid quick dividends, and a number of small towns, Stratonica, Acanthus, Apollina, uh, Arethusa surrendered without a fight to save themselves from destruction. Philip had no intention of meeting the armies of Linthos and the League in open battle, where he might be at a disadvantage. His strategy was to isolate the smaller cities in the east of the country by attacking them or fright fighting, frightening them into surrender. While Linthos itself was left unmolested, Philip's strategy was succeeding handsomely. When events forced him to abandon his campaign and return to Thessaly in the late fall of 349 BC. So that was, yeah, he was defeated in detail essentially, but let's see what's happened. Even before Philip's success at Olynthos had appealed to Athens for military help against Philip, in July an Athenian delegation reached Athens and concluded a military alliance with the Athenians. Athens assembled a fleet of 38 ships carrying a force of 2,000 peltasts. Ah, clever, you were only talking about Athens investing into peltasts. A light javelin infantry under the command of Chares. The Athesian winds delayed the fleet's departure for a few weeks and did not reach uh, my... my sir... my Kyburn, nah, the port of Olynthos. Oh, there it is. My Kybra. Okay. <clears throat> just, uh, just... Just here. This place. And did not reach the port. Oh, for a few weeks. By that time, however, Philip had halted his campaign and marched into Thessaly to deal with his difficulties there. For Ray had broken into open revolt, perhaps as a consequence of the return of Pythalos, one of the deposed tyrants. Eh? Oh no, I forgot to... I apologize to everyone who was happily listening, nice and cozy, but welcome in, uh, Juven Juventus Luna. Thank you very much for the raid. Welcome in, raiders. 
I hope uh, I hope you all had a lovely stream. It's uh, it's lovely to meet you, Jevon, uh, Jeventus. Uh, what were you What were you up to? What were you uh, Were you doing anything fun streaming? Let me give you a quick shout out before I give. Uh, oh wait, I don't remember. Do this, and then there we go. <laughs> oh, you're using the cute. Oh, my little emotes. <laughs> <laughs> but welcome in, welcome in everyone. My name is Rua Ua Quilta. Rua Ua Quilta. Uh, I am an Irish Fenian warrior, a warrior scholar, uh, from about the 200s AD, 300s AD. Uh, typically I uh, do streams of reading either history books, philosophy, uh, or I play the odd game here or there, or I do singing streams. Um, currently we're reading about Philip II of Macedon, uh, Greater Than Alexander, uh, by Richard A. Gabriel. We're currently uh, reading about Philip's kind of subsequent rise to power after his success in Thessaly. Uh, Philip II being uh, the father of Alexander the Great, for those who may not be too interested in this. But uh, to those of you who are joining us, I hope you uh, enjoy the soft reading. Uh, you can use me either as a an audiobook or just have me on in the background as you drift to sleep or just, just to relax, have something on, white noise, I suppose. But uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, I'll get back to the book. Where were we? Oh, yes. Faray had broken into open revolt, perhaps as a consequence of the return of Petholos, one of the deposed tyrants. The Pharaeans had taken steps to prevent the Macedonians from fortifying Magnesia, and had demanded a return of the port of Pagasse. Pagasse itself was also withheld, had also withheld the harbour and market taxes that were due Philip as their archon. By themselves, these events would not have required Philip to cease his campaign in Chalcides, or Chalcides, but the Phoreian revolt occurred as the Phocians won a series of victories over the Boeotians in the still simmering sacred war to the south, and it appeared that Phocus might try to restore its alliance with Phore and march into Thessaly in support. This greater fear of a Phocian invasion prompted the Thessalians to recall Philip to Thessaly and deal with Petalus. The Phoreian army forces were likely a small mercenary contingent in the pay of Pathalos, and no match for Philip's army. Though no accounts of the ma battle exist, it is certain that Philip made short work of the resistance, and drove Pathalos and his mercenaries from Thessaly. The mur much feared Phocian invasion did not materialize, and Philip decided to remain in Thessaly for the winter to quarter his army. While Philip was in Thessaly suppressing the Phoreian revolt, Another revolt broke out in the island of Euboea in February, February 348 BC that greatly concerned Athens. The island was of vital strategic importance. In concert with its allies Sparta and Phocus, Athens had already demonstrated its ability to block Philip's advance through the Thermop Thermopylae Pass in 352 BC, and as long as the alliance remained intact, Athens felt secure enough from land invasion. For those of you who uh, may not know, we'll pull up we'll pull up a map of uh, Thessaly. Uh, Euboea is is here. It's quite an important uh, island for for Athens. Uh, Thermopylae is just down here. Let's see what what happens. Athens, Athens was less confident about about Euboea, however, or Euboea. The island's western shore ran close to Attica and was connected to the mainland by a narrow bridge controlled by Cal Calcis. If Philip's, Philip could reach the northern end of Euboea by sea, he could then march down the island, cross into Boethia, link up with his Theban and Boeotian allies, and attack Athens itself. The key to any invasion was Calcis and its control of the bridge. So I'll actually pull up another map, uh, kind of a wider shot. Here we are. So you can see, uh, where's my pointer? There it is. 
the island of Euboia. Here's Tessaly and Euboia, and you can see it comes quite close to mainland Greece, and there's apparently a bridge uh, owned by Calxus down here. You can see that gives easy access into into this region. There's Delphi. You'd have Thebes, and uh, they would be very supportive of Philip in this situation. Uh, maybe they wouldn't, who knows. But Athens does not like this at all. That's way too close. It's like Olynthos down here. Relations between Athens and the state of Euboe had been generally cordial into the winter of 348 BC when Callias, the leading politician of Chalcis, led a rebellion against the Second Athenian Confederacy to which many states of the island belonged. Callias proposed the formation of a pan euboean league instead, and a number of states joined him. What had been a relatively secure border for Athens was suddenly threatened by political instability. While Athens was already deeply engaged in supporting Olynthos in the Chalcides, Chalcides against Philip. I wonder if Philip have any hand in that. Athens responded to the Euboean uprising by sending troops to support the pro-Athenian faction, while Callia summoned, summoned additional forces from Philip. As early as 3051, ah, so he was supporting them, no wonder. 351 BC, Philip had already established a strong diplomatic correspondence with the Euboeans, and may have all have had a hand in encouraging Callias in his rebellion. That Philip sent additional forces to support Callias once the revolt began suggests that Philip was preparing to exploit the situation in Euboe, if only to distract the Athenians from its efforts in Chalcides. Or Cal Chalcidius. Chalcidius. No, that's not right. <laughs> that sounds like a like a like a Sith, Calcidius. Uh, Pro-Athenian factions suffered a series of defeats. In the resulting negotiated troop, all of Euboe became independent, leaving Charistus, Char the only Athenian ally on the island. Under the influence of Callias, Chalcis was now openly pro-Macedonian and the threat of a Macedonian invasion from the island was a stark possibility for Athens. It forced Athens to maintain a large naval presence in the area to guard against Philip landing his army in the island's northern sector, tying down more Athenian naval assets precisely when it needed them to transport troops and cavalry to support Olynthus. In the spring of 348 BC, Philip was again in Chalcides, this time campaigning against the western cities and much closer to Olynthus itself. He took Apolli Apollonia, and not long after, Tyrone. Chare's fleet, which had been based in the key port of Mechaburna, had returned to Athens, perhaps in early spring. By summer, Mechaburna fell to the Macedonians, greatly reducing Olynthus's ability to receive reinforcements from Athens. Wow, okay, so I, so I didn't realize just where, how deeply he had gone, but he has essentially taken over... Terone, or Terone, Micabera, uh, I don't know if I can see Apollon Apollonia, but uh, he is very, very close to Olympus. If they were sent at all, Athenian ships would be forced to disembark their troops and cavalry at a much greater distances from Olympus itself, giving Philip plenty of time to react. The Olynthians had already appealed for Athenian aid when Philip entered Chalcides. The Athenians had responded by outfitting a relief force of 18 ships carrying 4,000 light infantry and 150 cavalry under the command of Charidemos. This force joined the Olynthians and attacked those cities in the west that had already gone over to Philip, putting the Olynthians in the position of attacking the cities of members of their own alliance. These operations accomplished nothing except they occupied the Olynthians and Athenians in areas where they could do little to threaten Philip, who was ready to attack Olynthos itself. Meanwhile, the Macedonian navy 
had intercepted and looted a number of merchantmen off Euboe, and had even captured the Athenian sacred tri trireme at Marathon. The Athenian sacred trireme? The navy also conducted a successful, successful raids in the harbours of Lemnos and Im Imbros. Philip's improved naval capacity put considerable Olynthian sea trade at risk and the Macedonian navy raids could not have gone unnoticed in Athens, Greece's preeminent naval power. I want to look up the Athenian sacred trireme real quick. Uh, Athenian sacred trireme. Ancient Athenian sacred ships were ancient Athenian ships, often triremes which had special religious functions, such as serving in sacred possessions or embassies, embassies or racing in boat races. The two most famous ships were the Paralus and the Sal Salaminia, which also served as messenger ships for the government in the 4th, 5th and 4th centuries. The Delos, uh, the, believed to be the ship Theseus had sailed in Crete, Hmm. I wonder if I type in Philip. Ah, no, unfortunately not. It doesn't say which one he he had taken. Philip tightened the noose around Olynthos's neck, and in June he was outside its walls, preparing to bring the city under siege. Olynthos had anticipated this move a few weeks earlier, and had sent an emissary to Athens asking for additional military support. Once more, Athens assembled a relief force. Seventeen ships carrying two thousand ship troops and three hundred cavalry were prepared for transport. The importance that Athens placed on its support of Olynthos can be inferred from its decision this time to send citizen hoplites instead of mercenaries. The three hundred cavalrymen were also citizens and made up thirty percent of the entire Athenian cavalry force. Once again, Command of the relief expedition was awarded to Chares. But it was now late June, and the Etesian winds had begun to blow, making the transit from Athens to Olynthos impossible. As he had done before, Philip had timed his final assault on Olynthos to coincide with the season of the Athesian winds. The transports carrying the Athenian leaf force would be were unable to put to sea for forty days. It's like they never figured out how to deal with that. I guess they were kind of busy getting BTFO'd everywhere. Uh, but, you know, at some point they'd be like, hmm, maybe we should anticipate that he's going to invade around this time and send some people then. <laughs> Philip's army was only seven miles from Olynthos when the city's defenders sent a message asking Philip for terms. Philip's reply reflected his contempt for Olynthos and the way its rulers had betrayed him. Quote, for the rest of time, it is not possible for you to live on, the Olintho on Olynthos and me in Macedonia. Philip had no intention to coming ter to, of coming to terms with Olynthos. Doing so would not solve the strategic problem Olynthos and Chalci Chalcidius. Chalcidius presented to Macedonia. His only solution was to destroy Olynthos and annex the entire Chalcidian Peninsula, making it an integral part of the Macedonian national state. Philip's ultimatum left Olynthos little choice and did nothing to diminish the resolve of the city's defenders. Philip was forced to bring the city under siege. The assault began in July, and by September 348 BC, it was over. Olynthos was a large city, with good fortifications and high walls. Its garrison must have been at least 4,000 strong, counting some of the Athenian mercenaries who had arrived earlier, and seems to have initially put up stiff resistance. A two-month siege, however, was very short as Greek, sie Greek sieges went, and short even by the new standards set by Philip's siege engineers. Diodorus tells us the fighting was heavy and that, in the course of constant series of assaults, he, Philip, lost many of his troops in the battle for the walls. The reports of, ma of heavy Macedonian casualties in the course of a constant series of assaults suggest that Philip was pressed hard to take the city quickly. Perhaps he had been informed that the Athenian relief force was ready to put to sea as soon as the Atesian winds subsided. If so, Philip had her until early October to vanquish Olynthos before the Athenian relief force landed at his back. After two months of fighting, 
heavy casualties, and perhaps with no end in sight, Philip may have found another way to take the city. Diodorus tells us that, quote, Eventually he bribed Eutycrates and Lathenes, two of the Olympian cavalry commanders, through whose agency he took the city by treachery. As noted, Eurycrates, or Euthycrates, and Lathenes were both friends of Philip and openly pro-Macedonian. In their political sentiments, they had been only they had both only been appointed to their military commands when Oly the Olympians sought to placate Philip's suspicions of Athenian loyalty. Once more, Philip's policy of making the friends he one day hoped to find useful paid off. Demothenes says that the two commanders brought their 500 cavalrymen and their weapons over to Philip. But this deflection, defection by itself could hardly have caused the city to fall into Philip's hands in the treacherous manner that Diodorus says it did. While we have no details, there must have been much more to the agency of the two officers that had brought about the capture of Olynthos. Because Olynthos had betrayed Philip, he forced upon it the harsh fate he reserved for traitors. He turned the city over to his army, which went on a bloody rampage, killing the civilian population indiscriminately. A small number of people escaped, but most were either enslaved and forced to work the mines of Macedonia, or, as Diodorus says, were sold into slavery. Philip gave some of the Athenian women as gifts to his fr guest friends and supporters in other Greek states. Among those captured were members of the Athenian relief expeditions. Their numbers were probably small, but according to Demothenes, they too were sent to the mines. This is in contrast to uh, a previous time, I'm quite sure, when Philip uh, allowed, I think it was the Athenians as well, to, uh, to be returned home, to return home after a victory. A larger number of Athenian soldiers were captured throughout the campaign and after the fall of Olynthos. Philip had always released captured Athenians in the past. This time he kept them, and they were not released until the peace with Athens was sealed in 346 BC. Philip sold off the booty taken from the city and as a result of this action, he secured an abundance of money for waging war and alarmed the other cities which, which were at war with him. Presumably, the Chalcidian cities that had not yet surrendered to Philip did so now, and the Chalcidian League, which, with its history in, of interference in Macedonian affairs, was disbanded. Philip ordered Olynthos raised to the ground. Demothenes claimed that Philip destroyed many of the cities of the Chalcidian League, quote, all of which he destroyed so brutally that it is hard for a visitor to tell if they were ever inhabited. This claim is false, and neither Justin nor Diodorus mentions such destruction. Only Stagoras seems to have been destroyed and was done so early in Philip's campaign as an example of psychological warfare. It apparently was a success, since many of the Chalcidian cities surrendered to Philip without resistance. Moreover, Philip had come to annex Chalcidus for its natural resources, ports, taxers, tim taxes, timber, and other resources. Important gold and silver mines at Stratonica Stra also greatly added to his wealth. It made no sense for him to destroy Chalcides, only to have to rebuild it later. Olynthos, however, was destroyed brick by brick, reduced to two flat top mounds of rubble the once powerful city of 10,000 ceased to exist. Philip distributed Olynthian land to his companions and other important persons, distributed cash gifts to important men in the other cities of Chalcides, and in this way secured the services of many men willing to betray their city. Philip intended to integrate the whole of Chalcides, or Chalcidius. Chalcidius. Why can I not pronounce that consistently? The whole of Chalcidus into Macedonia and establishing friendships with the powerful with the powerful in the country's cities reassured them that their positions were not threatened. It was the first step in winning their loyalty. Philip did not import did not import large numbers of Macedonians into Chalci Chalcidus, as he had done in other places. With the fall of Olynthos and the surrender of Chalcidus, Ma the Macedonian state expanded farther to the east, making it the most powerful and largest of the Greek states. Before leaving for Pella, Philip attended to one last detail. 
he had his half-brothers executed. This is a good time to uh, pull up, I think, this map, which shows essentially uh, the conquests of Philip's, uh, Philip's time. Remember, initially, Philip was essentially hemmed into oh, this region, effectively here. And large parts of the coast was owned by Athenians and other, other groups. Now, Philip, well, <laughs> he's pretty strong. <laughs> And I know it shows Greece down here as like a unified state. This is not the case for these regions. There, are, There's a lot of leagues and stuff happening around here. How many more pages do we have of this chapter? Okay. We have... Yeah, I think I'll keep going for a little bit. The collapse of Olynthos and Chalcedes was a severe blow to Athens, which had no allies left in, Ter in the Termaic Gulf and northern Aegean Sea. In the east, only the fickle Thracian king Sertablites stood in the way of Philip's advance towards the Hellespont. Philip's brilliant execution of Macedonian grand strategy was eroding Athenian power, and there was little Athens could do to stop it. The End of the Sacred War While Philip was fighting, the Sacred War waged on in the south. After the defeat at the Crocus Field in 352 BC, Phalos, the Phocian commander who had replaced the executed uh, Onomarchus, set about recruiting more mercenaries and allies to the Phocian cause. In late 352 BC, Phalos succumbed to a wasting disease and was replaced by Phalacus, who held the Phocian command with two other generals. Phalacus recruited additional mercenaries and in 349 BC went on the offensive, delivering the Boeotians a series of defeats and capturing the cities of Coronae, Corsier, and on Orcomenus. By 358, 348 BC, the Phocians controlled much of southwestern Boeotia. It was a high water mark of the Phocian military effort thus far, and Thebes was near exhaustion. The Phocian allies, Sparta and Athens, were occupied with their own problems. Athens had just considered, had just uh, suffered considerable reverses in Thrace and the Chironese at the hands of Philip, and Sparta was bogged down in a war in the Peloponnese. For those of you who don't know, the Peloponnese is essentially uh, this region, and Sparta used to control this whole region. Effectively, the Peloponnese was, and the Peloponnesian wars was the war between Athens and Sparta and it waged a couple of decades before Philip came to power. Well, no, it was, yeah, it was only like a couple of years. Hydrate, thank you very much, D. I think I do need it. It was, it was, my throat was getting a, a little dry. Had Philip wished to do so, he could have easily forced the now only lightly defended pass at Thermopylae, joined with Thebes and defeated Phocus, bringing an end to the sacred war. But again, Philip had no desire to end the war so long as it continued to weaken all the major Greek states except Macedonia. Philip spent 347 BC in Thessaly, resting his army and attending to calming down the Thessalians who pressed him to march south and exterminate the Phocians in revenge for ancient wrongs. Mm. A dispute broke out between the Thessalian state cities of Phar Pharsalus, a major contributor to the Thessalian League, and the small port city of Halos, the last city in Thessaly with pro-Athenian sympathies. Philip set the Macedonian navy to work protecting the Thessalian coast and raiding Athenian shipping. He watched from afar as the Greek states wore themselves out, dealing with their own problems. Phalacus's offensive and his capture of Boethian cities in 348 BC sent fear of the Theban spines. Diodorus tells us that, quote, 
The Boethians were so under pressure in the war and suffering from the loss of many troops and from the lack of financial resources, sent envoys to Philip with a request for aid. He dates the Theban request to early 346 BC. Until now, there had been no formal alliance or cooperation between Philip and Thebes. Only their common interest in defeating the Phocians had, had placed them on the same side in the war. But Philip was still technically the commander of the forces of the Amphitionic Council arrayed against Fo Phocus and could hardly ignore the Thebans' request. Strategically, however, Philip had not worked to reduce Athenian power in Greece, only to see Thebes replace it once the war with Phocus ended. Thus, quote, the king, Philip, delighted to witness their Thebes humiliation and eager to deflate their lutrictic arrogance, a reference to Theban behavior after its battle at the its victory at the Battle of Leuctra sent only a few troops, for he took pains to avoid being seen by public opinion as one who looked on impassively as the, at the plunding of the oracle. The war went on, and the stalemate continued. Meanwhile, events in focus began to spin out of control. In the summer of 347 BC, Phaelicus was removed from the command of the army, and charged with plundering the Delphic treasury. What? They were the ones who... Pl who plundered it in the first place. We have no information about the nature of the factional politics that were at play, but clearly Phaelicus was removed in some internal power struggle and charged with stealing the Delphic treasure, an accusation that could have led to his execution. A, triumv a triumvirate of generals took command of the Phocian army in his place. Philip dispatched troops to the Thebans in early 346 BC, when they joined the Thebans and attacked the city of Abay. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Hang on. I did legs today and my, my hamstring is cramping. I had to straighten out my leg. Oh, that's painful. Ah. That's painful. Okay. It's past, I think. Ow. Sudden cramps suck. Uh, where were we? When they joined the Thebans and attacked the city of Abay, which the Phocians were attempting to fortify, the Phocians were convinced that Philip intended to attack south with his Thelesian allies. Phocus appealed to Athens and Sparta for help. The Spartans sent a thousand hoplites under the command of Archidamus III, their king, or one of their kings, I assume. They usually have two. Athens sends, sent General Proxenus, or Prozenus, to take over the forts controlling the road from Thermopylae to central Greece. These three fortified towns, Alponus, Th Thronium, and Nicaea, were the key to blocking Philip's access to the Thermopylae Pass and to preventing his movement into focus. Uh, Athens also voted to send fifty triremes and their crews along with a large number of troops. The Allies intended to block Philip's southern advance at Thermopylae, as they had done after his victory at the Crocus Field. In addition, Athenians decided to commit a small force to assist Halos in the dispute against Phar Pharsalus. Philip could hardly ignore the, th the Athenian provocation, and in February 346 BC, Philip sent troops under Parmenio to take Halos at under siege. Having made arrangements to block Philip's advance, Athens turned to restoring its position in eastern Thrace in the Chironese. In 347 BC, Athens had sent an expedition under the command of Chares to Thrace, where it joined with the wily Sertablides. <sighs> this guy just can't stay down. Having changed sides again, Sertablides established several garrisons along the coast of the Sea of Marmara. In response, Philip dispatched Antipater, or based Antipater, and a small force to keep an eye on events in Thrace. Antipater set up a base on the coast of, uh, to monitor Athenian movements in Thrace and the Chironese, but did not engage the troops. Prior to these events, Philip had taken the first step towards a negotiated peace with Athens immediately after his capture of Olynthos in 348. 
After taking the city, Philip retired to Diem and celebrated the autumn festival in honor of Zeus. The games associated with the festival were accompanied by the Olympic truce, a period when those traveling to and from the games were protected from attack or capture. That, that summer, Macedonian privateers had captured the Athenian city named Phrynon and held him for ransom. At the Athens sent an embassy to Philip demanding the man's release. Philip agreed the seizure was illegal and the man was released. More importantly, Philip sent back a message with Cessaphon, the Athenian emissary, that the king regretted the war with Athens, that he had been forced into it, and that he now wanted to end it and cl conclude a peace with Athens. Athens should have accepted the offer given its own weakened position in the Tremaic Gulf, Thrace and the Chironies. As always, Philip was trying to obtain by diplomacy what he had not yet achieved by war. The factionalism of, the of Athenian domestic politics, however, made it impossible for Athens to accept Philip's overture. Instead, the Athenians warned that Philip could not be trusted, and that the danger he represented to all of Greece was greater than ever. Arguing that war with Philip was inevitable, the Athenians urged Athens to seek an alliance of Greek states to oppose Philip. Philip's peace overture collapsed, and Athens sought allies for war. In 346, Philip made another attempt to settle things diplomatically. The fate of the Athenians captured by Philip at Olynthos and being held prisoner was an emotional issue at Athens, and in early 346 BC, the Athenian assembly sent Aristodemus, an actor and an old friend of Philip's, to Pella, to determine what Philip intended to do with the prisoners. Empty-handed, Aristodemus returned with the news that Philip wanted peace and, and an alliance with Athens. This time, Athens was in no position to refuse. While Philip was trying to arrange a peace with Athens, though through diplomatic means, he was simultaneously engaged in efforts to erode the military arrangement Athens, Phocis, and Sparta had assembled to protect the Term Termopylae Pass. The results of Philip's labor reached Athens just as Aristodemus returned from Pella with the news of Philip's desire for peace. The Athenians also learned to their great dismay that Phalacus, the commander of the Phocian mercenaries, had seized power with the aid of his mercenaries and was now in command of the Phocian ally, army. Holy shit, this guy's back. He had imprisoned the Phocian ambassadors who had promised Athens control of the fortresses of Alponus, Thronium, and Nicaea controlling, controlling Thermopylae, and the Athenian general sent to assume control of the forts was told to keep out. Oh, whoa, the Phocians are changing sides now. Phalacus turned on the Spartans next and warned the Spartan king not to enter Phocis. The carefully crafted military arrangements Athens made to prevent Philip from advancing through Thermopylae collapsed. The question is, why did Phalacus expel his Athenian and Spartan allies at a crucial time and leave himself vulnerable to attack by Philip? One can only speculate. First, it is obvious that Phalacus' position was less than secure. He was imprisoned by his he had imprisoned his enemies and forcibly taken power with the support of mercenaries. Phalacus had every reason to suspect that Athens and Sparta might support his enemies in a counter coup, and thus kept them out of the country. Second, Phocus was financially exhausted. Even the melted down treasures seized at Delphi had been spent. Phalacus could hardly expect to keep his mercenaries' loyalty without the money to pay them. Third, even with sufficient allies and money, Phocus was doomed if, if Philip decided to attack in force. Finally, Phylacus knew that the Thessalians were thirsting for a violent revenge on their Phocian enemies. The only person who could restrain the Thessalians and prevent Phocus' destruction and enslavement was Philip. Thus, Phylacus may have decided that the only way to save himself from Phocus was to reach some sort of accommodation with Philip. The Athenians sent a delegation to Pella to begin negotiations with Philip. It arrived in mid-March for 346. Athens continued to insist on its right to Amphipolis. Oh my god, they're still going on about that. Its right to Amphipolis and to support Halos in Thessaly. Philip rejected both positions out of hand, but he suggested that Athens and Macedonia recognize each other's possessions in Thrace. At that time, that both parties operate, cooperate in fighting the rampant problem of piracy in the Aegean, that they conclude a formal peace and defensive alliance. As a sign of good fate, Philip offered two things. To release 
uh, to release the Athenian prisoners taken in Olynthos immediately and without ransom, and to recognize Athenian influence in Euboea. Hello, son. Hello. It's amazing how modern the ancient world is sometimes. Uh, which, uh, which aspect was, uh, did, uh, did that make, did that catch you in the reading? Well, it is, uh, oftentimes it's, um, going back to what Dee said about wanting to, uh, to play Civ. It's just map games. It's just, it's just guys painted maps. Just dudes being bros. And D being being cool, <laughs> the modern petty politics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I suppose for Phalicus, having uh, having deserted the side of the Athenians and Spartans, and thrown his lot in with Philip, it was essentially a a uh, how would you call it? What's the word again to describe uh, a realist position? I suppose kind of recognizing the, the danger and being like, well, I'm going to throw my lot in with the guy who seems to be on the rise and hopefully he doesn't kill us all. But I find I find this stuff, yeah, like, more interesting than, you know, um, you know, fiction books of, of politics and wars between countries or between, like, fictional states. Even, even like, things like Game of Thrones, which is a really, really well-written and gorgeous to read. Um, this stuff is just so good. He also promised not to attack Athenian possessions in the Chironese as long as the, as the negotiations were in progress. The Athenian envoys returned to Athens and pre presented Philip's proposals to the assembly. As soon as the Athenian envoys left Pella, Philip and his army marched into Thrace to settle affairs with the treacherous Sertablites. Before leaving, however, he had sent an embassy to Athens to confirm his, term, his terms, to reassure the Athenians that he was sincere in his effort to conclude a peace and to conclude the negotiations. He's so sneaky. Real life is stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. It oftentimes is. But he's so sneaky, he's like, you guys, you guys, you know, will recognize the current situation in Thrace and then immediately pushes to, to uh, dispose or at least severely weaken the one Athenian ally in the race, set of Lethes. In 347, Athens had supported set of Lethes again and had helped him to construct some coastal forts. In response, a small Macedonian advance force under Antipater had been sent in February 347 to monitor the Athenian movements. Philip's army now linked up with his advanced force, and on April 20th attacked Cetablites fortresses at Herion Orus and defeated him. Philip spent another two months reducing the independent coastal Thracians' forts, completing his operations around mid-June. Philip allowed Cetablites to remain king, but reduced him to a vassal while taking some of his sons as hostages to guarantee the Thracian king's good behaviour. I think he's finally gotten this guy down. Philip then forced Teres II, the successor to Amadocus in central Thrace, into the same vassal relationship. With western Thrace virtually integrated into the Macedonian state of affairs as far as the Nessus River, Philip's Thracian campaign of 346 created a double buffer zone between the new eastern Macedonian border and the Black Sea and Persia beyond. By the end of June, Philip arrived in Pella by ship ready to deal with the Athenians and what remained of the sacred war. While Philip was campaigning in Thrace, the Athenian delegation had returned to Athens and began debating Philip's terms of peace for an alliance with Macedonia. On the first day of the debate, Philocrates, a member of the delegation to Pella and a proponent of peace, peace with Philip, arose to address the assembly. Bear in mind that this is not the time to engage in contentious rivalry, that the affairs of the state are not in good con situation, that many grave dangers surround us, for we know that the Boethians and the Bagarians are at enemy enmity with us, the Peloponnesians are courting some of the Thebans and others the Spartans, the Chians and the Rhodians and their allies are hostile to our state, and they are negotiating with Philip for his friendship. He might have added that Phocus was exhausted and all but ceased to be an Athenian ally by exposing the Thermopylae Pass, 
that Certablites had been defeated, that Athens no longer had possessions in Thrace, and that Philip was in a position to attack Athenian interests in the Chironese at will, and to block the grain shipments through the Hellespont. Athens was isolated, exhausted, broke, and easy prey for the Macedonian king, should he join the Thebes with Thebes and invade Attica. While others argued that Athens should attempt a grand coalition of Greek states to oppose Philip, the realists prevailed. A few days later, the Athenian assembly agreed to the peace of Philocrates, or Philocrates. The agreement called for a peace treaty between Philip and Athens, along with an alliance which amounted to a mutual non-aggression pact. For Athens had allowed had, had to swallow swallow the bitter pill of renouncing its claims to Amphipolis, which had become an integral part of the Macedonian state. It is significant that the agreement did not address continued Athenian support for Phocus, Halas, or Sertablites. In one sense, the issue of Athenian support for Phocus and Halas would be resolved when the sacred war was officially over. In another, however, Philip's approaches to Phalicus, his siege of Halas, and his recent successes in Trace had already, in fact, decided those issues. Their formalization in a later treaty, concluding hostilities, could wait. For the moment, Athens was seeking to protect itself from any future Macedonian effect, attack, by conducting a peace and non-aggression pact with Philip. Phocus, Halas, and Certablites were on their own. In April two <laughs> 2009, what? In April 29th, on April the 29th, the Athenian delegation set out for Pella to meet with Philip, to seal the agreement with formal oaths, and to secure the release of the Athenian prisoners uh, taken at Olynthus. Since Philip was campaigning in Thrace, the delegation travelled at its leisure and arrived in Pella 23 days after leaving Athens. They waited another 27 days until Philip returned from Thrace on about June 17th. The Athenian delegation must have been surprised to find diplomatic delegations from most of the important Greek states, including Thebes, Sparta, and Phocus, already in Pella. By now, the Athenians must have suspected that Phalicus and Philip had entered some sort of agreement, even though they could not have known the details. A Phocian delegation's presence at talks is circumstantial evidence that Philip had already made an arrangement with Phalicus, the details of which were soon to be shockingly evident to all. The Athenians had come to Pella to, conc to conclude a bilateral agreement, only to find themselves in the middle of the larger negotiations addressing how Philip intended to settle the sacred war. Much was at stake for Phocus, Thebes, and Sparta. On one hand, if Philip had the support of Thebes, the Theban allies in the Peloponnese, the, the, the Thessalians, the Athenians, and, the destro and destroy the Phocians, the effect would be to confirm Theban power in central, central Greece, at Athenian expense. On the other hand, if Philip joined Sparta, Athens and Thessaly and Phocus in alliance, then Theban power in the region would be broken. Sparta, for its part, feared that Philip would invade the Peloponnese, using the Theban subject states to foment rebellion as an excuse to come to their aid. Athens was safe from Philip's wrath as long as he swore his allegiance to the peace. It was the fate of Phocus, Sparta, and Thebes that hung in the balance. As expected, Thessaly and Thebes wanted Phocus destroyed, while Athens and Sparta argued that the Phocians could not be held collectively responsible for their actions or their bla blasphemous leaders. Philip, always the diplomat, listened carefully to both sides and led each to believe that he supported its position. While the negotiations continued, Philip did not hide the obvious signs of the large military build-up taking place at Pella. The Thessalians openly boasted that the army was an aimed at an invasion of central Greece. Philip dismissed the delegations concerned, and explained that the troops were needed to bring the siege of Halos to a successful conclusion. Under Parmenio's capable command, the siege had been underway since February. It seemed to have occurred to no one how remarkable it was that such a small town had held out for so long against Philip's engineers. Nor did anyone seem to notice that the Macedonian army at Halos was only two days' march 
or 44 miles, from the vital pass at Thermopylae. The Athenians were eager to have Philip swear the oaths that would bind him to peace and the alliance before events got out of hand. Philip delayed the oath swearing, pleading that not all of his allies were present. Philip then said he was needed at, ha at Halos and the Athenian delegation would have to accompany him and his army as it marched to Halos. Oh, now he's stopping them from even being able to move, to return back. When the party reached Phare, Philip swore the oath and the peace of Philocrates who came into being. The Athenian de oh, okay. The Athenian delegation boarded its ships for home at Pagasae. Once more, no one seemed to have noticed that Philip and his army were uncomfortably close, only 62 miles or four days march, to Thermopylae. Let me pull up. Oh. It what am I screen? Oh. My uh, screen turned off automatically. <laughs> Scared for a moment. Uh, he's only here. And there's Thermopylae. The Athenians were eager. Oh, sorry, I read that. The peace with Athens concluded. Philip marched his army south towards the Thermopylae Pass, making ready to determine the outcome of war in pitched battle. On the march, Philip picked up the Thessalians en route and arrived in Locris with a large force. It is unlikely... <clears throat> Excuse me. It is unlikely that the force that accompanied Philip and the Athenians to Phoray was the entire Macedonian army. By, the time, by this time, Philip could put 24,000 infantry and 3,000 cavalry, including the Thessalian cavalry in the field. The Athenians, already suspicious of Philip's intentions in central Greece, and fearful that he would indeed march on Thermopylae, could hardly be expected to believe that a force of this size would, was needed to bring the siege of Halos to the end. Thus, the army that accompanied Philip to, and the Athenians to Phare was probably a much smaller force, one whose size could convince the Athenians that it was really targeted at Halos. One might venture to guess that a force of some 8,000 to 10,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry might have sufficed to convince the Athenians. Twenty-two miles south of Phare and 44 miles from Thermopylae, Parmenio was still besieging Halos. The size of his force is unknown, but it could hardly have been less than 6,000 men if the siege was to be seen to have seemed credible by the Athenians who passed Halos en route to the Pella negotiations with Philip. Halos was no located on the coastal road leading to Thermopylae. Since the city was no longer Philip's concern now that the Athenians had abandoned their support for it, for it Parmenio's troops were no longer needed there. They joined Philip on the way south. <laughs> oh, that is... That is an expert politic... politicking. Let's pull up this, uh, this map of the region of Thermopylae, shall we? They joined Philip on the way south. Diodorus tells us the Thessalians, who probably provided large contingents of cavalry, also linked up with Philip. These units were either stationed at Lamia on a regular basis, or they could have been sent there from Larissa before Philip marched to Foray. Lamia was only nine miles from Thermopylae, and its strategic location made it likely that at least some Thessalian units were regularly stationed there to act as a screen against the Phocian incursions. Philip may also have sent the sent the rest of the Macedonian infantry to Lamia in advance, if Diodorus is correct. That Philip expected a pitched, a pitched battle, it made sense to have the entire Macedonian field army at his disposal, especially so after the battle. If after the battle, Philip's threat to invade central Greece was going to be credible. Philip's force, augmented by Parmenio's troops, probably met up with the rest of the Macedonian infantry and Thessalian cavalry 
coming from Lamia just outside the Tamrapalai Pass. Lamia being right here, so he would have come down this road and met up with them. When Philip reached Termopylae, his army probably numbered 20,000 infantry and 2,500 cavalry. Philip's arrival caught the Phokians by surprise. They had been misled by Philip's promises that he intended to settle the sacred war peacefully. It is unlikely, however, that Philip's arrival surprised Phalicus and the mercenaries guarding the pass. Phalicus' army, numbering only 8,000 men, was deployed in the three fortress towns south of the pass, from where they could quickly assemble at the pass itself and throw up a defense. So there's the actual pass of Thermopylae and the three cities this region. Diodorus tells us that when Philip arrived, Philicus, who was lingering in Nicaea and saw his, that his numbers were unequal to the task of taking on Philip, entered into negotiations with the king with a view to concluding an armistice. It is unlikely, however, that Philicus was cowed by Philip's army. Philip and Philicus had already reached some sort of agreement several months before. That agreement resulted in Philicus re refusing the troops of Sparta and Athens of offered to defend Thermopylae against Philip. Part of that agreement may have been, been that in exchange for his own life, his men's life, and the fair treatment for the people of Phocis, Philicus agreed to deliver the pass to Philip. Philicus kept his part of the bargain and surrendered Thermopylae to Philip without a fight. An agreement was made permitting Phalicus to depart with his troops wherever he wished, and he retired to the Peloponnese with his mercenaries, who were around 8,000 in number. Philip's army poured through the pass and occupied the fortress towns. All of Greece, from Attica to the Peloponnese, was now at risk of Macedonian attack. And that is the end of uh, chapter 6. We got a nice really nice chunk done today oh. my throat is a little little sore though a lot of reading but uh, I hope those of you who were listening in uh, enjoyed <laughs> thank you Dee uh, I try to do little little voices a little bit of practice like not nothing too just kind of like hoffy and uh, kind of like diplomatic speak uh, when reading little little uh, quotes and stuff. Ugh. My body's really stiff. I really need to go to that physio and have them have them like fix me. <laughs> Hopefully, I should be okay by the end of next week, or even two or three weeks if I have to do some exercises just to strengthen up things again. But uh, I think it's getting. Ooh, excuse me. It's getting uh, very fun uh, reading how Philip. Seeing the plan at play by Philip uh, come to fruition to take the Thermopylae Pass. That had it been guarded by a large army of Athenians, Phocians, Folk Folk and Spartans, would have been almost impassable. Yeah, he did pretty well. Of course, you know, you could have... Oh, you know, he could have gone around. No, I'm pretty sure at that point they had guarded those those kind of other uh, ways to move around. So it would have been a very, very hard fight. But instead, Philip, through his diplomacy, has taken probably the last real way that the Greeks could have stopped him without giving a full-pitched battle. But I'd like to thank you all for, for joining me today. We're going to look for uh, for someone to raid into. Let me just do a quick skim. Uh, I raided into Rakudo last time. Ooh, I know. We should raid into... Foxy Shroom Witch. She's uh, popped into, uh, into the chat a couple of times. So let me take these off. Real quick. Uh, 
and she's she's quite nice and she's doing some ASMR as well so hopefully it kind of it's a nice way to move from from one thing to the other but uh, I would like to thank you all for joining me today uh, definitely enjoying getting uh, deeper into the story Philip is quite the impressive individual uh, I guess uh, I'll send you guys off, Garev Mila Mahagat and Slan Gafoyle, and I will see you guys next time.